chapter 19, a proper perspective of Paul, a magnified office. Throughout time and eternity, God's characters remain constant and will always remain unchanged. Yet during the last 6,000 years, God has shaped his communications with man according to the generation and or people group to which he was primarily focused at any given time. Understandably, as God's specific message and his expectations varied from one period to the next, so did the messages of his messengers. Naturally, the Bible record shows that God rarely changed his plan and purpose abruptly. Thus, there appear in Scripture obvious, identifiable, transitional periods. This is especially true during the early church period. The particular transitions during that time generated changes in both message and messenger, and every conscientious Bible student must account for these shifts. Failure to do so has caused confusion, many egregious errors, all avoidable. The church that began as a body of Jewish believers, Romans 11:17, transitioned to a mostly Jewish body. Subsequently, the church morphed into a Jew and Gentile body and eventually into a mostly Gentile body, Ephesians 3, 6. During these transitional times, while the Jews were being admonished to forsake their Judaism and trust Christ, the Gentiles were being admonished to turn from their dead idols and trust in the true and living God, Acts 14.15. The underlying message was the same for both Jew and Gentile, trust Christ as one's personal Savior. Yet the specifics of the messages often varied based upon the distinct heritages, peculiar circumstances, and inherent expectations of the Jews and of the Gentiles. Even the person's response for delivering the message varied. The chart on page 286 is titled Church Body, Jew and Gentile. Paul expressed this distinction in the book of Galatians when he pointed to the distinct ministries associated to himself and those associated with the other apostles, especially Peter. Galatians 2.7 But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, that is the Gentiles, was committed unto me, Paul, as the gospel of the circumcision, the Jews, was unto Peter. Paul's primary focus was ultimately directed toward the uncircumcision, that is the Gentile, while Peter, James, and John were to focus their energies primarily upon the circumcision, that is the Jews. After the other apostles met with Paul, they agreed that Paul's focus was distinct from their own. Paul and his group were to go to the heathen, the Gentiles, and Peter and the other apostles were directed to continue their ministries to the circumcision with the same gospel. Galatians 2.9, And when James, Cephas, that is Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, that is the Gentiles, and they unto the circumcision, that is the Jews. This passage from Galatians chapter 2 does not reflect multiple gospels as some have suggested. The gospel of God's grace was preached by both Paul and Peter, with each of them directing their preaching primarily to a distinct people group. Peter confirmed his preaching of the same message as Paul when he said, We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we, that is the Jews, shall be saved even as they, the Gentiles. Acts 15.11 The chart on page 287 is titled, Peter and Paul's Message. There's no distinction in salvation. Paul's admonition in Galatians further confirms this truth. Paul never would have agreed to the terms of the meeting in Jerusalem if Peter was guilty of preaching a contradictory gospel. Instead, he would have called Peter accursed. Galatians 1.9, As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. While the same gospel, that is good tidings, was being preached to both Jews and Gentiles, this did not resolve the difficulties faced by the Jews in fellowshipping with or accepting the Gentiles. This struggle is clearly revealed when Peter chose to hypocritically separate from the Gentiles to avoid being seen by Jews sent from Jerusalem, Galatians 2, 11 and 12. He further admitted personal struggles in his second epistle when he confessed the difficulty of understanding some of Paul's writings. 2 Peter 3.15, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, 
as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned, unstable, rest, as they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. The difficulty for Peter and the other Jewish believers was not necessarily in the complexity of doctrine taught. Their struggle revolved around the acceptance and comprehension of the barriers broken down between Jew and Gentile in Christ Jesus. As such, the maturation of the New Testament church brought with it a noticeable emphasis on the Pauline ministry. While Paul was not the apostle to the church, he was the apostle of the Gentiles. As such, he magnified his office. Romans 11:13. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Prior to Paul's salvation, God had a plan and purpose for his life. According to God's plan, Paul was God's chosen vessel to bear the name of Christ to the Gentiles, to kings, to the children of Israel, Acts 9.15. Although most Gentiles today take for granted their inclusion, especially as found in Paul's ministry, God's inclusion of the Gentiles in this list is quite significant. For thousands of years prior to the New Testament, God dealt primarily with and through his chosen people, the Jews. Historically, the Gentiles' access to God came through the Jews, although Paul initially ministered to the Jew first in each location, Romans 1.16. The primary focus of the ministry was ultimately to be the apostle of the Gentiles. There is no doubt amongst serious Bible students that Paul's life and calling were unique. Even his conversion experience was unprecedented, occurring on the heels of the pivotal time in the New Testament. The impact of Paul's conversion and testimony was so important that the book of Acts records it three times. Acts chapter 9, 22, and 26. His unusual conversion was just a foreshadowing of his unique ministry. Acts 9, 15. But the Lord said unto him, that is Ananias, Go thy way, for he, that is Paul, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Paul's ministry was unlike any other man's ministry. Christ appeared to Paul while Paul was on his way to mercilessly persecute Christians. God saved him and sent him forth to minister. Although Paul was an apostle among other apostles, he was the apostle of the Gentiles. In other words, while there were numerous apostles to the Jews and eventually to the church, there was only one apostle specifically designated as the apostle of the Gentiles. This was a God-given office and one Paul felt compelled to magnify. Romans 11:13. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Unfortunately, far too many Bible teachers struggle to find the proper balance concerning the Apostle Paul's ministry. A small minority have elevated this apostle to the point that he is the only authority for the church. Everything becomes completely focused upon what Paul wrote. This is dangerous and detrimental. Men with this view almost always neglect the Bible as a whole and eventually turn from many of the sound doctrines historically accepted, held, and believed by the church. Others err on the other end of the spectrum by minimizing the apostles' importance in a church vastly consisting of Gentile believers. Sadly, many of the schisms in the body of Christ find their roots in one of these two extremes. As with all other matters of faith and practice, we should magnify Paul's office in the same manner that the Holy Bible magnifies it. We should emphasize things to the extent to which God emphasized them and obey God's commands in accordance with this emphasis. This is our aim and, more importantly, our responsibility before God. The pertinent questions concern the scriptural emphasis of Paul's office and ministry. How do we focus upon the truth and not become enamored by the particulars? Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. If the reader does not already appreciate the Apostle Paul's special responsibility to the Gentiles, simply believing the scriptures should reinforce that understanding. The scriptures clearly prove that Paul was ordained and appointed a preacher, a teacher, and apostle of the Gentiles. 1 Timothy 2.7, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. 2 Timothy 1.11, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. Yet Paul's ordination to the ministry was unique in several facets. Since the scriptures record that Paul was to be a preacher, an apostle, and teacher of the Gentiles, every Christian should determine the ramifications of this truth. 
by spending a little time and study, we can grasp what effect Paul's writings should have on those living today. After all, it was God's Spirit that led Paul to emphasize this peculiar ministry. According to God's leading, Paul ministered Jesus Christ to us. He revealed the truth and enabled the previously outcast Gentiles to be an acceptable offering to God, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Romans 15, 16, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. On page 290, the chart is titled, Paul's Magnified Office and Ordination. Paul was not the first apostle to take the truth of the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Gentiles. So far as we know, Simon Peter specifically had that honor in his first visit to the house of Cornelius, where he clearly preached Jesus of Nazareth, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him, God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Acts 10, verses 39 and 40. Footnote number one, Philip in Acts chapter 8 could be considered someone that preceded Peter preaching to a Gentile as Philip preached Jesus to the Ethiopian eunuch. The eunuch responded that he believed that Jesus is, not was, the Son of God, thus indicating an understanding of the resurrection because Christ is alive in heaven. Simon Peter called Cornelius to action when he said, Whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins, Acts 10.43. Despite Peter's interaction with Gentiles, Paul was able to claim his role in laying the foundation of Jesus Christ for these Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 3.10 According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Paul laid this foundation, or planted it, 1 Corinthians 3, 6, as Apollos and others followed with the watering. Thereafter, every other person was to take heed how he built upon that particular foundation. Throughout history, some have built upon that foundation rewardable works, like into gold, silver, and precious stones. Others have built perishable works, like into wood, hay, and stubble. That will vanish at the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.10. The trouble comes when men fail to build according to the foundation laid in the early church, which is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.13, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work shall abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. If Paul's elevated position were not enough, the Apostle Paul claimed that God set him forth as a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting, 1 Timothy 1.16. Contextually, the pattern focuses specifically upon the area of salvation, trusting in Christ's completed sacrifice upon the cross. Yet surely the doctrines set forth by the Apostle Paul after salvation are also to serve as a pattern for the New Testament church today. After all, Paul received an abundance of revelations that had been kept secret since the world began, Romans 16.25. The chart on page 292 is titled, Paul, a Wise Master Builder. In other words, Paul divulged truths to the church previously unknown or kept secret from man. Those who neglect or minimize the ministry of Paul do so in ignorance, ultimately resulting in the loss of rewards, the judgment seat of Christ. Furthermore, this same approach to the Bible generally causes great confusion within the body of believers. With these truths evidently set forth, God clearly called Paul to a special ministry in relationship to the Gentiles. Yet the truths discussed only serve as a starting point for Paul's influence. According to the Apostle Paul, God specifically used him to disclose the dispensation of the grace of God or the dispensation of God to the New Testament church. Ephesians 3.1, For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a foreign few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Colossians 1.25, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Paul boldly claimed, When you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. 
But how did Paul receive the knowledge he set forth? He could not have learned it from the other apostles, because according to Paul, it was given me to you word, and no man taught him. Where did Paul receive the revelations that he penned? While most students of Scripture are familiar with Paul's encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus, see Acts chapter 9, few realize that the Lord appeared to Paul on multiple occasions. Acts 26.16 But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of the things in the which I will appear unto thee. During those subsequent appearances, the Lord revealed truths to Paul for him to preach and pen those revelations. This time was an amazing period of transition as God's focus was widening to include both Jew and Gentile in one body. Page 293 has the chart, The Dispensations of God. Prior to Paul's conversion, many crucial truths for understanding the complete work of Christ on the cross remain unknown. This is especially true as it pertains to the Gentiles who would come to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. As time progressed, the Bible says that these truths were now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, Ephesians 3, 5. While these truths were not exclusively revealed to Paul, he was the individual tasked with the dispensing of such truths among the Gentiles. Ephesians 3, 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ." God wanted to show the church, Colossians 1.24, his will, his way, and his plan. God chose to reveal the completed details to one man, the Apostle Paul, so that he could write about these truths. In fact, Paul's calling involved making all men know and understand church age mysteries. At least 10 of these mysteries listed below were revealed by the Apostle Paul to believers in their fullness. The mysteries in this chart Number one, Israel's blindness. Number two, the church's translation, the rapture. Number three, the mystery of Christ, that all Jew and Gentile are one in Christ. Number four, the mystery of Christ in you. Number five, the mystery of godliness may be equivalent to the mystery of the Father. Number six, the mystery of iniquity, the devil incarnate and the Antichrist. Number seven, the mystery of the gospel, evidently the gospel, the grace of God. Number eight, the mystery of the faith, that the word is the source of salvation in all doctrine. Number nine, the mystery of his will, God's purpose for the ages. And then number 10, the mystery of God, God's plan for the ages. Paul's influence upon the church. Perhaps all of this attention placed upon one man makes the reader a bit apprehensive. Consider that in churches today, more error results from not obeying God's clear command to follow Paul than from any other cause. Repeatedly, Paul admonished whom we are to follow. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 4, 16, Wherefore I beseech you, be followers of me. We follow Paul as he followed Christ. Any person that seriously considers the errors and schisms propagated by many of the cults, denominations, and churches finds that these groups generally ignore or minimize the writings of the Apostle Paul. Paul's writings reveal our foundation, the presentation of the Lord Jesus Christ, but the revelation does not stop there. Paul's epistles also explicitly show the Christian how to walk and how to grow spiritually by following Paul as he followed the Lord Jesus Christ. With these scriptures, the picture of God's plan and purpose should surely be getting clearer. A person during this age is established according to the gospel revealed to Paul and the revelation of the mystery as he set forth. Romans 16, 25. Now unto him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which kept secret since the world began. The spiritual ignorance among Christians has resulted in the overall degradation of Christianity. While a newborn Christian is properly likened to a baby, Hebrews 5.13, God never intended for any believer to remain in such a spiritually immature state. As the believers, God intended, as the God intended maturity of the believer progresses, the baby Christian grows into a Christ-centered self-sufficiency in Christ. As such, 
We desperately need to grow in our walk so that we might please God. According to Paul, God sent him to help in one's spiritual walk with the understanding of how to please God. 1 Thessalonians 4.1 Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. Paul faithfully fulfilled his calling. For his faithful service, one can scarcely imagine heavenly rewards awaiting Paul for his availability to God's service, 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. Since Paul laid the foundation, 1 Corinthians 3, 10, his influence appointing saints to Christ has spanned two millennia, first for salvation of the lost and then for sound doctrine for the child of God. Paul's reward, at least in part, seems to be that he will be given the opportunity to present saints to Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, 2. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. The chart on page 296 is titled, Paul's Unique Influence. What are we to do? Those who fail to appreciate the significance of Paul's office and the magnitude of his responsibilities do so because of a failure to accept the Bible as both literal and authoritative. Far too many preachers use a spiritualized method of Bible teaching rather than considering the scriptures for what they say literally. In other words, the plain teaching of scripture and hard to recognize passages are relegated to meaning something other than what they plainly state. The results have clearly been borne out in today's churches. The spiritualizing of passage or figurative interpretation has resulted in a very shallow type of Christianity, even a carnal Christianity. Because of this failure, it is far too common for Christians to remain spiritual babes their entire lives. The emphasis Christians place upon a God-called spokesman is far from unique to our age and time. The Bible student who considers what Paul says to us today and takes the words literally is comparable to listening to Noah before the flood, Moses during the exodus from Egypt, and Joshua while entering the promised land. These are just a few examples that could be mentioned. When a man does not follow God's appointed spokesman, he does so at his own peril. Just as Paul obediently followed the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to follow the doctrines, commandments, instructions, and revelations of the Lord Jesus Christ given to us by the Apostle Paul. The importance of this truth bears repeating. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, they remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. 1 Corinthians 4, 16, Wherefore I beseech you, be followers of me. Consider the two alternatives, either recognize and accept the God-given authority given to Paul to command us to follow him, or believe that Paul simply exhibited an extremely egotistical facade. You may be the judge of Paul now, but the Lord will be the judge of you later. God commanded us to listen to what Paul said by reading the inspired scripture given to him for us. The same man God used to teach us how to walk told us to follow him. To further develop the importance of following Paul's admission to us, the apostle wrote in verse 2 above, Remember me in all things. Each person must decide to what extent he is going to believe God. Was Paul led by the inspiration of God to write these directives? Did God appoint him to his position? Was Paul uniquely chosen by God to give the truth to us? If you do not get your primary guidance from reading Paul's epistles, from where do you get it? Some claim, contrary to Scripture, that you should place yourself under the law again, Romans 6.14. Some say you should make the transitional book of Acts your primary guide. Others claim that we should follow all the specifics laid out in the four Gospels. The truth is that it is impossible to simultaneously follow all the above. What are Christians to do? Are we to try to follow all the commandments or practices of the law, the prophets, the Psalms, the Gospels, and the book of Acts? Impossible. So what is the solution? The answer to these questions is found in Paul's epistles. Paul wrote that if we remember him in all things, then we will consider what he says and have an understanding in all things. 2 Timothy 2.7 Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. According to the Apostle Paul, consideration of the revelation given to him opens one's understanding in all things. In other words, once we understand what Paul wrote for us during this age, the other periods and portions of the Bible will be easier to understand and comprehend. The seemingly contradictory verses will be easily reconciled. One will then understand which portions of the Bible are applied spiritually and which are applied doctrinally. The key is to ensure that 
any course of action does not contradict the God-given guidance through the Pauline epistles. After all, he is the apostle of the Gentiles, and we are to follow him. On page 298, the chart is titled, Consider What I Say. When confronted with a question concerning baptism, the Lord's Supper, Holy Day, Sabbath Day, special meats, how to live, how to be saved, first consider what Paul said. Failing to follow Paul will result in confusion, 1 Corinthians 14, 33, and bewilderment. Philippians 4, 9, Paul writes, Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. If ye had lived prior to the flood, God would have wanted you to listen to his spokesman during that time, right? During the exodus from Egypt, listening to God's spokesman would have been crucial. Does it make any less sense that God would continue using this same method and pattern for conveying his truth to man during this age? What about today? Who offers to the church the clearest guidance? Noah, Moses, Samuel, David, Paul, the two witnesses, the 144,000? The Bible teaches that we should do what we have learned and received and heard and seen in Paul. Any Christian wanting to learn God's word must follow God's method of instruction to the believer. Study and rightly divide the Bible. If one does not study the Bible dispensationally by rightly dividing it, there is no possible way to truly understand its meaning and purpose. Such a person will be a vulnerable target for those who use the Bible to teach their doctrine and their belief system. Beware, the Bible can be made to say whatever a person wants to teach simply by ignoring the correct way to study, preach, and teach it. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. One who divides the Bible will easily recognize that not all Scripture is addressed to him. It is impossible to simultaneously follow everything in every part of Scripture without disobeying or ignoring portions of the Bible. As we consider the revelation given to the Apostle Paul, we more adequately obey our God-given commandments. In the end, we learn how to walk and increase our heavenly rewards by obeying the simple commands to follow Paul. This is the end of chapter 19. 